are uh, getting started here at the uh, new year in a new series called Derailed, uh, Unbiblical Beliefs That Cause Believers to Fail. And uh, we're going to be looking at several different topics, but the overall theme verse for this series is coming to us from Galatians chapter 5. If you want to go ahead and turn there, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7, and uh, then we'll get into the text for the uh, topic uh, of the unbiblical belief. Uh, We'll get into Romans in regards to that. So let's get the overall theme for this new series, Galatians 5, Galatians 5 and verse 7. Why don't you go ahead and stand for the word tonight? <clears throat> I know many of you worked and today, and uh, you're probably pretty, pretty tired, so I'll let you uh, get seated here in just a moment. Galatians 5, 7. Let's read it together, shall we? It's the theme, so I want us to uh, acquaint ourselves with this verse uh, throughout this series. It's a short verse, but it is powerful. It says, Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? One more time. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Basically, Paul is telling the church at Galatia, um, you were running well, uh, but what happened? Something derailed you. All right, so let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Now, this is going to deal with the subject or the topic, the unbiblical belief that we're going to be addressing tonight. And so let's look at what Romans 6 has to say. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Everybody say that. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein, know ye not, that is, uh, that so many of us as were baptized unto Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, that means uh, under the waters of baptism, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye, everybody say reckon. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Somebody say, praise God. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Father, thank you for your word tonight. May you open it, Lord, and sow the seeds of this gospel lesson into our hearts and in our minds. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody say amen. Now you can be seated. As we get started tonight, I want you to imagine three different people, okay? Uh, And the names that I have here for these people are just randomly selected. So uh, if you're 
name or middle name happens to coincide, please don't think nothing of it. Okay? The first one I want us to think about is a guy by the name of Rick. Rick is a Christian, and he is home alone on a Friday night. It's been a long week at work, and uh, Rick is tired. His wife is at her mother's house with the kids, and, and Rick is a little bored and a little restless and uh, not really in the mood to read. So he thinks, well, I'll just go online and check out some sports scores. And so on the website that he goes to for the sports scores, are uh, various alluring photos of women that are scantily clad. He thinks to himself, "Mm, I wonder what these photos look like up close. So he decides to click on the photos. And in a matter of just a few moments, he's clicking on raunchier and raunchier sites. All the while, Rick knows that what he's doing is wrong. It's morally wrong. But he thinks to himself, I can do it and get forgiveness later. After all, Christ died for my sins, so what I'm doing is not that big of a deal. I'll just ask God for forgiveness later. All right, then there's uh, Felicia. Felicia is living with her boyfriend. She knows that it's not a good arrangement, but they don't have the money right now to have the wedding that she's always wanted and dreamed of. She wants to go back to school and further her education, so the timing for getting married is kind of bad too. Plus, even though they've talked about it, there's no date set and her boyfriend hasn't been pushing to set a date. I mean, why uh, why commit if you don't have to? Hello? Felicia is a churchgoer and every week during times of prayer at her church, she feels convicted. So she prays and she says, Lord, I'm sorry for living with my boyfriend. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Even though I keep repeating this over and over again. And we really have no plans to change. Finally, let's, uh, let's look at the third one. There's Jacob. Jacob accepted Christ five years ago at church, but he's, he's hardly grown as a believer. Uh, he tried a Sunday morning class, but just for a little while, he really just didn't seem to connect with anyone there. And so Jacob got busy at work, and he hasn't been able to be faithful to church over the last four years. He finds himself angry at work a lot, especially angry at his boss because there's been a lot of cutbacks at his company and they've just kind of put the workload over on him and it's quite overwhelming. And so he and a few of his friends email one another jokes and funny cartoons about their boss and about their ridiculous company policies. And Jacob also occasionally finds himself lying to their customers in order to keep them happy. In a lot of weeks, he, he finds himself going out with some of his coworkers after work for happy hour. And over several occasions, he stepped across the line with a female coworker, even though he's married, and so was she. But Jacob says to himself, I feel I'm going to heaven because I accepted Christ into my heart about five years ago, so I, I'm sure I, I feel my future's taken care of. Besides, it really doesn't matter what I do now because God will always forgive me. Uh, 
Now, you may not personally identify with the scenarios that I have just mentioned, and that's a good thing. But the truth is, church, they take place far more often than we would like to admit in our churches across the American culture. So, on your worksheet, the question is, have you ever deliberately sinned, like said or did something that you knew was wrong, but you did it anyway because you said, it won't matter because God will forgive me later when I ask him to. I want you to think on that for a moment. Let me continue that line real quick. Is it okay for us to give full vent to our anger because we know that we can be forgiven later? Is it okay to push ahead with a family breakup because after all, we're really unhappy and and God will forgive us after the divorce goes through? Is it okay to borrow what's not ours and not return it? Or is it okay to have intimate relations with a boyfriend or girlfriend? Because after all, God is a forgiving God. And and we're planning to ask for his, his forgiveness afterwards. Somebody say, it's quiet in here. Well, it should be because this is a heavy topic. And we're starting this new midweek series that I've titled Derailed, Unbiblical Beliefs That Believers Believe That Cause Them to Fail. And tonight I want to start by giving you a formula. Notice it on your worksheet. A sincere Christian plus false beliefs equals a derailed Christian. How many know we've got too many derailed Christians? Christians in our culture. Or you can put in that place of derailed, you can put in there disillusioned. Because <clears throat> the false belief that I want to challenge tonight is the idea, notice on your worksheet, that it doesn't matter if I sin because God will always forgive me when I ask. Folks, this is one of the myths that our enemy has used for over 2,000 years to derail believers and make them ineffective and to make them entirely unfruitful. And so to understand our text, the verses that I read from Romans 6, We really have to set this chapter in the context of Romans chapters 3, 4, and 5, and especially Romans 5, where Paul celebrates the the awe-inspiring wonder of the grace of God. Now, look at the description, for example, of the people for whom he said that Christ died. That's given to us in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but I'm I'm going to ask you, who are the people for whom Christ died? He says in chapter 5, 6 through 10, they were not competent folks. They were not God-fearers. They were not obedient friends of God, but rather they were weak, ungodly, sinful enemies of God. And then in chapter uh, 5, 20 through 21, Paul speaks about the triumph of grace over all that oppresses humanity, which specifically deals with three things, the law, sin, and death. Say it with me, law, sin, and death. Now, Romans 5, 20 through 21 says, The law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Somebody say grace. Grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, 
If we want to understand the structure of the book of Romans, we have to realize that Paul deals with each of the forces which oppress humanity in turn. Notice on your worksheet, in Romans 6, Paul deals with the triumph of grace over the oppressive power of sin. In Romans 7, the triumph of grace over the oppressive power of the law. And thirdly, in Romans 8, the triumph of grace over the oppressive power of death. And so in Romans 6 now, having spoken so much about how God's grace is given to the utterly undeserving, Paul, who was a brilliant preacher and theologian, anticipates his audience's objection. The objection here, notice on your worksheet, is what the critics were saying about Paul's doctrine of grace. They said, Paul, Paul. You've made salvation too easy. Because they're saying if people are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, then, that, then what difference does it make if a person continues to sin? Now, I hope you tune me in right here. Because this is a question. This whole lesson addresses a question that I've had folks ask me. Many times. Why, pastor, do I keep committing the same sin over and over again? So there, the objection is, Paul, you've made salvation too easy. In fact, if you think about it, Paul, if grace is shown to be all the more gracious when God forgives the particularly awful sins, then why don't we just go and deliberately commit those awful sins so that God can really be shown extremely gracious? Hello. Is this making sense? Paul, let's just deliberately sin because God's going to forgive us anyway. Now, unfortunately, that's what some people were saying in the church at Rome. And most likely, if they were saying it, you know they were doing it. Huh? Sadly, a matter of fact is that's what many people say today in our generation to do. Some time ago, I saw a bumper sticker that read, Christ paid for our sins, so let's Get our money's worth. Huh? I can only pray that that was a sarcastic bumper sticker. Because if not, then I believe that individual is in for a hair-raising experience come judgment day. Right? They say, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go ahead and do this sin because I can always ask for forgiveness later. I, I know I'm going to church, let's say, on Sunday. And during the prayer time on Sunday, I'll ask God to forgive me. So the objection to Paul was, Paul, you've made things too easy. People in their sinful corruption is going to start abusing grace. Sinful people will throw God's grace back in his face. Okay, so that's the objection. Now, notice that the Apostle Paul doesn't answer this objection by saying, you've, met, you've misunderstood me. His response is for us in chapter 6 and what we read in verses 1 and 2. Shall we continue going on sinning? So that grace may abound, or in the Greek means increase. And what's he answer? He answers his own question. He says, God forbid. And the original Greek for the words God forbid was words that mean, may it never, ever, ever be so. And so when we, uh, I was thinking this afternoon, when we object to Something today we say maybe something like, oh, that's absurd. Or that's ridiculous. 
I totally reject that line of thinking. Paul is responding in that way, responding to the person who says, well, because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, I might as well sin because my sin is covered by grace of God when I ask for forgiveness later. I want us to see that our generation is not the first people to think that way, right? Because the New Testament book of Jude, everybody say Jude, little bitty book, but uh, but a powerful, dynamic message, speaks, Jude speaks about folks like this all the way back in Jude 1 and 4. He tells about a group of people who had crept everybody say crept they crept into the church he said unawares basically under the radar and who had turned the grace of God into lasciviousness what is that it's a license to sin okay That's exactly what they did. Way back 2,000 years ago, there were people in the church who said, it doesn't matter if I lie and telling the truth will get me into trouble because I can always ask God's forgiveness later. It doesn't matter what I do morally because God will forgive me anyway. I can refuse to forgive someone who has hurt me I can stay angry and bitter and not respond to their offer for a renewed relationship because, after all, God's grace covers it all. All right. Question. Is that what grace really is? Is grace just a rug under which we sweep all of our sins? Is grace just a ticket that we get punched that admits us to heaven and then we are free to do as we please. Think about this with me. Let's take another passage from the New Testament. I want you to imagine Christ's story of the prodigal son. I'm going to give it to you with a little twist. Okay, so you know there's this boy who takes his father's money and he heads out to enjoy the, the world. He, he spends all of his money on, on things, maybe alcohol, women, and partying. He ends up with no friends, no support system, and no one to help him. He's homeless. He's hungry. And this young man decides the only hope for him is to go back to his father. Not as a son, but as a servant slash slave so he goes back to his father when his father sees him he runs out to greet him hugs him kisses him gives him an expensive ring a beautiful robe throws him a party the father celebrates saying my son was dead but now he's alive he's lost and now he's found do you think that this story of the father's welcome to his son could just as easily have ended this way Okay, well, the boy stayed home with his father for about a month. But then he got bored again because daddy's house wasn't exciting enough. And so the boy went back to the father and says, hey, dad, could you give me some more money? And his father says, gladly, son, I didn't expect that my love and all my gifts and the welcome home party would change you. I'll just keep giving you money so you can keep going out and doing what you'd like. And each time you come home, I'll throw you another lavish party. Do you think such an ending would be consistent with Christ's story of the prodigal? And would it be in line with the rest of the revealed grace of God in Scripture? Would the father say, sure, son, here's 5000 more dollars because I didn't expect that my grace would change you. After all, the point of grace is just to keep giving you money so that you could go blow it as you choose. To answer that warped thinking, the apostle Paul says, God forbid. May it never 
ever be so. Paul says, God forbid that you would have such a distorted view of the grace of God. And the point of grace is not just to keep giving us money so that we can blow it irresponsibly as we choose. No, the point of grace is to change us. Amen. So here we go. Paul responds to this mythological thinking with four steps. I want to give you the four steps together, then we will address them separately or individually. Paul says, number one, we must know something. Number two, we must remember something. Number three, we must offer something. And number four, we must consider something. Let's go and begin with step number one. We must know something. What do we need to know? We need to know God's grace changes us. That's what the Apostle Paul in 6 and 2 says, that a true believer, he has died to sin. Now, how many know death is a pretty colossal change? Huh? Wouldn't you agree? This means that if you are a believer joined to Christ through faith and united with him in what is portrayed and displayed in the text through water baptism, then you must be aware of a big change produced in you. And Paul says as you go under the waters of baptism, you are vividly portraying the fact that you have been joined to Christ's death. And what does the apostle mean? That we who are believers have placed our faith in Christ to save us. What's he mean when he says we've died to sin? Some folks struggle with the meaning of that. One one expositor, John Stott, he said that when he was a young Christian, he was taught that it meant to be rendered absolutely insensitive to sin. He goes on to illustrate, he says that he was taught that if you were walking down the street and you saw a dog laying in the road and you didn't know if the dog was asleep or dead, you go over and you kick it. If the dog didn't respond at all, you knew it was dead. So he was taught, so it was with the Christian. We don't respond to sin. We're insensitive to it. It has no allure anymore. It has no draw. It has no pull. Now, okay, there's basically one big problem with that interpretation. There's one problem to saying that to have died to sin means to be rendered utterly insensitive to sin. And here's the first problem with that interpretation is that it does not comport with the experience of any Christian who has ever lived. I have never met a Christian, and neither have you, who would say, I don't feel the tug of any sin in my life any longer. I don't feel the pull. I don't feel the draw. If you can say that, you better check where you're at because you're going to be in heaven. Hello? The truth is, we all, everybody say all, we all still have within us a fallen nature which is attracted to sin. It is is that fallen nature that finds sin alluring. It finds sin temporarily satisfying because there is pleasure in sin for a season. Our fallen nature never just lays down and dies. Huh? Boy, it would be nice. Hello? So what does the Apostle Paul mean that we Christians have died to sin? 
It doesn't mean that our fallen nature has died and we will never find ourselves having to resist temptation's pull. It doesn't mean that as believers we will never sin again. It doesn't mean we are totally insensitive to the allure of sin. What the Apostle Paul is talking about here is dying to the rule and the reign of sin over our lives. And he shows us that in Romans 5, 20 and 21, where he portrays sin as a king, as a lord, as a master that exercises authority over a realm. And he says, believers, you used to live under the reign. You used to live under the authority, under the mastery, under the lordship of this power called sin. That's where you used to live. You used to live in a country that was dominated by a king named sin. But thankfully, Paul announces the good news. Christ, the Messiah, the conquering king, came into this country that was ruled by the king named Sin, and this evil king put Jesus, our Savior, to death. Death that was the ultimate power that the king named Sin had. His ultimate power was death. But Christ, hallelujah, who was too holy and too powerful for his weapon of death, wielded by the king named Sin, after three days Christ rose up from the dead, defeating the king named Sin. And he entered a new kingdom, a new realm known as the kingdom of God. And now Paul says, well, here's what happened to us as believers. When we placed our faith in Christ, we did not just get our ticket punched for heaven. That's not what happens in salvation. What happens is that by faith we joined ourselves to Christ and all that he is and all that he did, we are now uniting ourselves to his death and also to his resurrection portrayed in baptism by going under the water and coming out of the water so that when we place our faith in Christ, we are now transferred, transferred from under the lordship and mastery of that king called sin We're transferred into a new kingdom, a kingdom ruled by Christ, and God is our heavenly Father. Oh, somebody say praise God. So to die to sin is to no longer be a citizen of that country ruled by a king named Sin. Sin no longer, he said, has authority over our life. It no longer has to dominate us. We have torn up our citizenship papers. We've renounced our uh, allegiance to that king. We've gone through the naturalization process and have become a citizen of a brand new kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. You might want to say another amen right there. So what does all this have to do with a proper understanding of grace? Grace is not saying to the prodigal, hey, if you want to leave home again, go ahead. Here's some cash. When you return, I'll give you another welcome home party, some more gifts that you can use and abuse. Any way you choose. And if you want to hit the road again, do it. No, no, a thousand times, no. Hmm? Is this making sense? The Apostle Paul says, notice on your worksheet, that grace is like sin in that it is a power, it is a lordship. It is a mastery. That's why he uses the word the reign of grace. Grace is an authority to. Notice that on your worksheet. 
That's what Romans 5.21 says when he uses the interesting phrase, grace reign, the reign of grace. Grace is not a ticket that, that we get punched that gives us entrance into heaven. Grace is not a get out of jail free card. The grace of God is a power. It is a dynamic power that rules over our life if we are a true Christian. And that's Paul's argument in Romans 6.15. He says, what then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. You see, Paul in the book of Romans is dominated by his thinking regarding the kingdom of God. And the apostle Paul sees two different kingdoms, two different powers, two different realms, two different ages. One is the old age. In the old age, we were under the masters of sin and law and death. To be born into this world is to be born in the old age. Which since our first parents, Adam and Eve, it's been an age dominated by uh, sin and law and death. Our attempts to get right with God by our own performance will lead to death, the ultimate outcome of sin, and our self-help attempts. But now, he says, through our union with faith in Christ, we are ushered into a new age. In this new age, we come under a new set of masters. Instead of uh, law, sin, and death, it's grace, it's obedience, and eternal life. And so the bottom line is, we do not actually ever truly experience the grace of God without it changing us. Oh, I need you to get that on your worksheet. If you can say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, and yet I'm exactly as I was before I received Christ. If you can say that, then the Apostle Paul would say, I strongly doubt you've ever experienced the grace of God. Because you can't experience God's grace and not be changed. Because grace, if it is anything, it is life-changing power. Grace is like a hot stove. Hmm? You can't touch it without getting burned. And you can't touch grace without being changed. Oh, somebody ought to rejoice in the change that grace brought into our lives. Hallelujah. Okay. So step number one, we must know something, and that is God's grace changes us. Step number two, we must remember something, and that is we must remember who we are. Because 611 says we are to reckon. Remember I had you repeat that word? Reckon ourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ. Now the Greek word for reckon is the word from which we get our word in the English language, logic. Paul says of us coming out from under the reign of sin and coming under a new reign, the reign of grace, he says, I want you to understand. I want you to know what happened to you, believers, when you became a Christian. You no longer need to be dominated by the power of sin. Why? Because you have a new Lord. You're living under a new authority now. There's a new sheriff in town, and he's called the grace of God. So believers, he says, remember who you are. You are a citizen of a new country and state that's ruled by a new king. Can I be honest right here? It's like sometimes we get spiritual amnesia. Sometimes we don't remember who we truly are. And we don't remember where we truly came from. So Paul takes out the map here and he traces out our history for us. He says, remember who you are and walk this out, flesh it out. Romans 6, 4 literally means we should walk when it says in newness of life. That means step by step, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Huh? Right foot means I remember 
uh, uh, myself of who I am, left foot. I, I remember myself that I, I, I no longer need to be dominated by the power of sin. That's not who I am. Right foot, left foot, reminding myself every step I take, I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. Sin is no longer my master. I have a brand new Lord. And so he's saying, you need to walk this out until you can remember that. All right? Step number three, we must also offer something, and that is offer our body to God. This is what he says in verses 12 through 14. We read them. Don't fall out with me, but Bob Dylan, during his Christian phase, he wrote a song that said, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. He was speaking the truth. In this universe, how many know there's no neutral ground? Huh? We are always under a power. And the reason, notice this on your worksheet, the reason why we can't just sin so we can experience the grace of God and give, get forgiveness later is because we can't live under two powers or two kingdoms at the same time. Hello. The decision by some de believers to try and have one foot in the world dominated by sin and the other foot in the kingdom of God dominated by the Holy Spirit, how many know that's an impossibility? So the reason many so-called Christians are so unfruitful and ineffective is because they are trying to live under two different kings at the same time. And the way to stop doing that, Paul says, is you've got to give your body to one of those kings. And he says, I am going to urge you to offer your body to God in totality. Our physical body, that means our ears and what we listen to. That means our mouth and what we say. That means our eyes and what we look at. That means our hands and what we touch. That means our feet and where we go. That means our private life. All of us give our body to God in total surrender. Why? Why, Paul? Why do we have to turn our body over to God? Because if God has our body, he's got us. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm enjoying this. Maybe a little too much. I don't know. Because when I began to look at this passage, it led me to step four. We must consider something. He says, I want you to consider the results of sinning and then saying, I'll just get forgiveness later. You say, it doesn't matter if I sin because God will always forgive me. That's deliberate sin. And the Apostle Paul says, you need to consider the end results of that kind of deliberate and continued sin. And that's what he deals with in six. In 19 through 23. Because we say, ah, oh, sin doesn't matter. We'll get forgiveness later. Paul says, ah, oh, it does matter. Because when we sin, it is not just an activity. It's not just a bad behavior. Rather, get this, we are bringing ourselves back under the power of the old king. Named sin. And the old king always brings tragic results. Notice, let's, let's spell out the results. He says the first result of saying it doesn't matter if I sin because God, God will forgive me later. The first result of that results in slavery. So verse 19. Why, Paul? Because sin, remember? Sin is a power and it always has to be your master. 
And the problem with bringing ourselves under that power is we can't just sin once. Hello? Romans 6, 19. As ye have yielded your members servants to, and it goes on to say, to iniquity unto iniquity. That means sin and more sin. That actually means ever-increasing sinfulness. That means sin is like the old ad for Lay's potato chips. Remember that? You can't just eat one. And the problem with telling a lie is that you always need another lie to cover up the first lie, and then you need a third lie to cover up the first two lies. Ever-increasing sin. Wickedness. The problem with looking at porn is that you cannot just stop with one look. It is a power. It has to be the king. Are you going to help me tonight? One look will turn into three looks. And then an ever-increasing addiction. Same thing is true when we vent our anger. The same thing is true when we allow bitterness and unforgiveness to settle in our heart. The same thing is true when we give ourselves over to self pity. We're bringing ourselves back under the power of the king called sin. Don't want to become a slave again, do you? The second result is that it not only causes uh, us to be a slave, but it causes shame. Romans 6.21 says, What fruit or benefit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Folks, it is impossible to sin and not come under that dark cloud or, or feeling of God's fatherly displeasure. Sin is not just something we do to ourselves. It's an act of rebellion against God. And when we sin, we lose the favor. We lose the fellowship of God. We experience God's displeasure. And so, therefore, we feel ashamed. And it's hard for us to look up into the face of God when we're walking back under the power of the old master called sin. And God not only shows his displeasure to us, But the book of Hebrews tells us that God disciplines those straying children. So if life is really not working for us and the wheels just keep falling off, no matter what we try to do, you know, it's appropriate for us to stop and ask, am I experiencing my father's displeasure? Now, that's not always the case. Because bad things do happen to good people. The world is broken. It's fallen. And because of that fact, sometimes we go through storms because it rains on the just and the unjust. But I think with a mature believer, it really is appropriate to sit down and ask yourself the question. If the wheels keep falling off of your life and nothing's working out, ask yourself, am I experiencing the discipline of my father because of my disobedience somewhere? Thirdly, Paul says the last result of deliberate sin is death. Deliberate, continued sin always results in death. That's why he says, Romans 6.23, we can all quote it, for the wages of sin is death. That verse is spoken right here in our context of this whole topic. Wages. What are wages? They are given to someone who is employed by who or who is under the authority of. So we can't live under the power of sin and feel alive. Huh? Ultimately, if we continue in sin, we're on a track and a, a trajectory that will lead to eternal death, eternal separation from God. But even right now, every time we bring ourselves under the power of sin, we're drinking a little bit of that death unto us. Do you want to be dead inside? 
you want to feel joyless? No Christian can continue to live under the power of sin and yet live a joyful life. It's impossible. And so the Apostle Paul says, on the other hand, that the benefit we reap when we choose to obey God leads to holiness and results in not death, but eternal life. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When we choose to obey God, even though it is hard, Paul says the payment, the reward, is that God gives us a little more of his holiness. We begin to share in his nature, and we experience his pleasure in and over our lives. And the reason why obedience will lead to joy in our life is because when we obey God, we can look up into the face of our Father, and instead of feeling shame, we can feel his smile over our lives. I want God to smile on me. I say that again. I want God to smile over my life. I don't want to have to go through life fearing his discipline. Do you? Another way to put it, Paul says, is you then experience eternal life. Not just life after we die. But life right now, abundant life right now. That means a life of freedom, a life of internal peace, a life where we really do feel that we are loved of God. Abundant life. That's the life that Christ promised. And notice Christ died on the cross. I think this is the last thing, isn't it, on your worksheet? Not to punch our ticket for heaven and allow us to live any way we choose. He died on the cross to remove us from under the, the tyranny and the power of sin and death. And to fuel our life with an eternal experience of holiness and fellowship with God. Oh, what a beautiful experience. I want that right there. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would come to see our great need for truth and understanding of your grace. God, your grace was not and is not given to us so that we can live our lives as we choose, but so that we can freely live for you in this fallen world. Oh God, teach us. Father, teach us that we as Christians would begin to imitate you, not the world around us. Teach us what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. And I pray that if our liberties are causing us to sin, then I pray that you would convict us and lead us back to your righteousness. Lord, we've been saved by your grace through faith in Christ, so help us to see and to live out this truth for the rest of our time here on this earth. And as we close tonight, Lord, may your word be heard. And what is of me, I pray that it will fall to the ground and be no more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand together, shall we? I'd like for you to take your hymn book and turn to page 305. This is an old one, and I'm not sure if I'll get it right, so I need your help. But it's an old one. It says, His grace is sufficient for me. If you need the power 
to live like a believer tonight, you need to pray for God's grace because that's what His grace is. It's power to live a changed life. Amen? Many times I'm tried and tested as I travel day by day. Oft I meet with pain and sorrow and there's trouble in my way. But I have sweet assurance that my soul the Lord will lead and in Him there is strength for every need. Sing it now. For His grace is sufficient for me and His love is abundant and free. And oh, what joy fills my soul ah, just to know, just to know that His grace is sufficient for me. Hey, you're singing good. Let's go on to that second verse and sing it like you mean it. When the tempter brings confusion and I don't know what to do, on my knees I turn to Jesus for I know He's going to see me through. Then despair is changed to victory. Every doubt just melts away and His grace is sin. I lost it right there. Every day, oh, for His grace is sufficient for me and His love is abundant and it's free. And oh, what joy fills my soul just to know, just to know that His grace. I'll rejoice in that fact tonight, church.